I'm going to, I'm going to get this thing going. Um, this is the webinar today for um, livestock production is organic certification worth it. Uh, so I'll explain a little bit more about that, but I'll just start out with a little bit of background about myself real quick um, before we go get going. My name is Ryan Sawinski. I'm with the Rodale Institute as an organic livestock consultant on our organic consulting team. So we have about 12 members on our consulting team um, with various focuses on different aspects of agriculture, um, agricultural practices. Uh, so my specialty is in the livestock and dairy side. Um, and then the rest of my team has, you know, some crop systems and some other focuses that uh, are represented on our team. So a little bit about the background of me, as you can see here with the three pictures of, I like to say white collar, blue collar, and maybe in between collar. Um, I kind of held a few different hats um, in the past as a farmer um, and farmhand at a farm in Pennsylvania, as well as um, down in Georgia at White Oak Pastures. So I learned a lot of livestock um, tips, tricks, uh, good things, bad things um, along the way to really understand what it takes to, um, you know, produce or I guess raise livestock from birth to slaughter um, and everything in between. So uh, that, that does play a lot into this discussion today and I'll be able to kind of harp on some of those experiences that I had uh, along the way. But it's nice to meet everybody here virtually and thank you so much for joining. Um, and then as a little aside, if anybody has questions um, or any you know, statements they wanna make, feel free to use the Q&A and put um, your questions there. My colleague, Justin Barkley, will be monitoring that q and A. I I will not be. So um, if I don't get to you right away, my apologies. And with that, we'll kind of get going here. So a little bit about the Rodale Institute, if you're unaware <clears throat> or if you are, it's a nonprofit. And basically the way I um, kind of simplify it is we have illustrious research at the farm um, into the early and mid 1900s all the way until now. Uh, you can see a lot of that work on our website, and I'll be touching on a little bit of that today. Then we also have an, a, a wonderful education department to really provide farmer training, as well as different types of webinars like what we're on currently. Uh, and then last but not least, the consulting team, which started a few years ago. And the topic today is, is this organic certification worth it? So the reason we had this webinar is really because this comes up a lot in my work and I deal a lot with dairy producers as well as meat producers. But on the meat side of things, it really gets a little bit interesting when you hear about the different types of certifications out there, um, you know, local storytelling that can be done and that doesn't necessarily garner organic certification um, and still gets a lot of sales. So it's a, it's a big topic to discuss. And I don't, I don't think you're going to leave here with one or the other answer, but I think we'll be able to kind of understand what the benefits might be or what the benefits might not be. So um, that's kind of the genesis of this conversation. And we'll really try and unpack that as much as we possibly can. All right. So the four aspects I'll be touching on today is the first is the certification brief for anybody that might need a little bit more emphasis on what certification really means from a practical standpoint. Then we'll get into the worth it section of this webinar. And that doesn't always necessarily mean just economics, even though we will be touching on that. And that is probably the number one importance for farmers all around the world. But we'll also be touching on the ecosystem benefits and comparisons, as well as the nutritional differences that are becoming a lot more, um, I guess, trendy or popular in media, as well as in our uh, local communities. All right, so organic certification, again, I'm just gonna kind of go into a little bit of a brief on what is the practical side of this and really what it involves for the farmer. So why organic is like the number one question that we would start out with, right? So either you might have a direct customer demand, maybe you don't even have a farm yet. Um, maybe you have, you're producing some things and your neighbors might really like it. And, and they're asking, are, is this organic? Um, is it certified? Maybe those questions come up with your existing or new customer base. You might have new market access availability. This comes up a lot when we're talking about wholesale opportunities um, and different regional food service or um, 
I guess, supplier opportunities for farmers to be able to supply um, different types of markets that might need that certified organic label um, on their product in order to make this relationship occur. Uh, a value alignment, this one comes up a lot when we're talking about a full conventional producer shifting over to an organic producer, um, maybe using antibiotics and growth hormones is something that, you know, maybe that's what keeps the lights on at the time, but this is really not how the producer wants to, um, you know, go about their production practices. I see this a lot with our transition to organic um, consulting work is this is like the number one thing of just, I really want to change the way I produce my uh, meat and dairy as well as the last uh, producing greater than $5,000 in um, agricultural products. And you, once you exceed that threshold, you are no longer um, able to use that exemption of, you know, you, you can basically use an exemption to say you're organic with, when you're less than $5,000. But once you're above that, that might be another reason why you go through the certification process. All right. So what are the requirements, the why and the how? The why is really, this is the only certification that is USDA recognized as a national standard. There's a lot of certifications out there now for good and for bad reasons to really kind of make things for the consumer and for the producer a little bit more confusing. The one thing that is really good about USDA organic is that it is a national standard and it is treated like one. So that is kind of a really good baseline for, you know, if you're shopping as a consumer or if you're producing as a farmer to meet different market thresholds. Um, and then the how is really based on the land and livestock production methods. Uh, organic land management for three years, a, a prior land use agreement um, with any producers that may have been producing on that land prior, um, synthetic use or no synthetic use, my bad, and crop rotation implementation. And then the the record keeping being one of the big holdups that we'll get into a little bit on the worth it side of this. So the general five steps here are you complete an application, you submit an OSP to the certification body or certification agency. The certification agency comes out and does an on-site inspection to see if everything aligns with the OSP and is acceptable for the National Organic Program. Four is the evaluation of the inspection report by the certification agency. And then finally, a certification uh, decision that says yes or no, you can go organic. This is something that can get confusing pretty quick, but if you're in Pennsylvania and if you're in the States at all, um, using the Rodale Consulting Service is a very nice way to hold hands um, with you know, Rodale and then also with the certification agency to really make that process a lot more seamless uh, and easy for the farmer to approach. So we'll get a little bit into the nitty gritty here of the production side of things. I like to break this down into four things when it comes to livestock, the breed program, the feed program, the healthcare, and then the grazing requirements if, you, if you're producing ruminant animals. So when we talk about breed program, this can be a big piece of the um, side of making, making sure that this is a, a doable process. So you need to have uh, any ruminant animals must be born and or uh, managed organically from the last third of gestation or from an organic um, animal. So this is pretty much something that can hold some producers up at first if they're not fully vertically integrated on their breeding side of their pro uh, livestock programs. And then for um, chickens, it's their second day of life but I'll be focusing more on ruminant animals uh, for the purpose of this discussion. The feed program, all feed and feedstuffs that are used must be organic, uh, certified organic produced feeds. Um, and then as if you see at the bottom there with the grazing requirements, there also is a pasture rule to get um, grazing directly from the pasture for a baseline of days throughout the year and a 30% uh, uh, dry matter intake. Um, I don't wanna get too in the weeds with that right here and right now, but if this is something that you'd like to kind of unpack a little bit more or get some more details on, obviously it's online, but I'll have my contact information up after this and we can totally, um, you know, have a conversation about that if it, you know, this might apply to you. Um, and then the last tier is the healthcare. And really this is a big piece of organic production. And some of my colleagues really have a really good statement here of be, um, really 
doing things in the heart of, of certified organic. So there's obviously a baseline, but that baseline can be a little bit, you know, a little bit of a, a lower bar than some producers want to go. Some producers really want to, you know, maybe keep their cows out on pasture 300, 350 days a year. Uh, that's not required for certified organic, but some producers want to go above and beyond that bar. Um, allowing your animals to be out of confinement and in these different situations of being in the pasture rule and, you know, having good, good health care is a preventative way of management to avoid health issues to, to arise. Obviously, no matter what type of farming you're doing, you're going to see health problems, but really just reducing the risks of those health issues is a big piece of certified organic and above. All right, so first we'll get into the ecosystem comparison. So like, like I said at the start, we're gonna look at the ecosystem comparison, the nutritional benefit, both for the livestock and for the human. And then we're also going to look at the economical breakdown of what it costs and what it's worth to you as a producer. So the first thing I really wanna look at here Coming from the Rodale Farming Systems trial, um, a, a, you know, a 40, I think I was, we were talking to each out yesterday. I think it's at their 41st year now. Uh, what's something that they've been measuring? And it's really cool to actually see it. And remember, this is a cropping system. This is not a livestock system. However, it does measure manure um, and legumes as nitrogen inputs versus the conventional um, way of growing crops. So when you look at this here, this graph, we can see this, this is soil organic matter percentage, and this is the year in which the trial is in. So as you can see, the manure right here, the manure input for soil organic matter actually boosts soil organic matter the most in all three of these situations. For livestock producers, this is, this is incredible research to really rely on to say, holy crap, you know, I'm not growing, maybe I'm not growing corn and soy, but I'm moving cows or, or moving small ruminants on a daily basis and I'm getting that direct manure input right from my animals grazing on the land in my various way of rotational grazing or um, different types of amp grazing that you might see out there. And it's something that it really goes a long way, right? That's kind of the start of the cycle to really boost up the soil organic matter. And when you boost up the soil organic matter, you're seeing a better plant nutrient uptake. So for cropping systems, that's great because now you can grow great corn and great soybeans and not be reliant on um, you know, different synthetics to use it, but also for a pasture system, right? So when we're looking at a pasture system, the quality of the forage that's growing on our pastures is extremely important for that livestock healthcare side of things. Now I'll show a slide a little bit later down here, but just to kind of give a sneak peek, um, one of the things that I really look at within a pasture is the different types of varieties of forages. So if you're doing just a single species grass, you're gonna be missing out on different types of, you know, vitamin and minerals in those forages for your herd. And you might need to rely on some more um, inputs, you know, not necessarily synthetics. Um, it's gonna be some kind of mineral or salt block or something of that nature, but you're gonna rely on those a lot more um, than if you have a more uh, diverse pasture. Oh, another additional fact here is with the 15 to 20 percent increase in water infiltration. So Pennsylvania doesn't really struggle from this, but I, obviously this, is, this webinar is not limited to Pennsylvania. So in the, in the more arid climates um, where rain is a lot of, uh, you know, a bigger issue and, and water infiltration is a bigger issue, when you're looking at, you know, managing in a grazing situation and being able to move your cows and allow your soils to really have better water infiltration, then you're getting a situation where you're, that regrowth period is a lot quicker. Um, and maybe you'll be able to come back to that pasture, you know, year over year sooner, or a little bit more sooner year over year so that you can get better utilization out of your pastures. All right, some additional Rodale research. And again, this is mostly fixed on the, on the cropping trial, but it does apply to livestock scenarios as well. So we're looking at competitive with conventional yields. This is a big one, in, again, in our cropping system. But when we're looking at pastures, it makes a lot of sense, right? When I was saying utilization, rather than, you know, let's say you're relying on hay for half the year in your livestock um, operation. 
And then, you know, over the, t over the course of a few years, maybe five or six years, you're seeing that that hay bill is actually getting lower and lower because you're getting more utilization out of your pastures. You might be working on your stocking density a little bit better or really managing more on a day-to-day -day basis to see what that looks like within your rotation. My favorite stat here is producing yields up to 40% higher in, term, in times of drought. So what I just mentioned on that last slide about water infiltration and getting good regrowth out of your pastures is something that in organic systems, or if you wanna say regenerative systems, you're getting those you know, you're getting those little things that might not actually show up on your balance sheet, but they, they eventually will impact you financially um, in, a, in a very positive way because you're less reliant on um, off-farm inputs. And we'll talk a little bit about carbon emissions in a little bit. Okay, so when we go to per, uh, conventional production risks, and again, we're still in the ecosystem benefit here. We're looking at inputs like spraying, antibiotic usage, and animal confinement. Now, I don't know if anybody on the, on the call right now has actually worked on a, um, worked on a, a farm where they, there is animal confinement or anything like that. And obviously in some situations that works for some producers. In others, you can really tell that the animal is not as happy, right? So when they're, when they're in a confined situation, they're much more reliant on antibiotics. Um, and also their healthcare is, you know, is something really you need to pay attention, but as well in terms of the ecosystem, you're not getting that soil, um, regeneration, you're getting more of a degradation in, in those cases, because you're, you know, if you're in a, in a sacrifice paddock, you're destroying the paddock and kind of destroying soil health and, and all the things that go into that. So the effects of these inputs are lower biodiversity from your from any types of synthetics that you're using you're losing birds or bugs and really beneficial things that you need in the ecosystem to keep it intact uh, when we look at antibiotic resistance this is something that i'm not too sure i'm very in in the organic farming world so i hear about it a lot but in, you know in the average consumer world it might not be something that's talked about frequently when we talk about antibiotic resistance we're you know, we are what we eat, right? So when you eat and, and when you're eating meats or milk um, and those animals are being treated with antibiotics, that antibiotic resistance is being passed on to the consumer. Um, this can be a huge issue and has been a huge issue for um, some large diseases that have been shown in some studies in um, South Africa, I believe. I can share that in the chat um, after I finish up here. But it's something really to pay attention to when you're really, as a consumer, when you're in the grocery store looking at, you know, your three, four dollar a pound ground beef versus your certified organic farmer that might be, you know, 30 minutes or an hour out of the way. Um, and then I already touched on the soil degradation piece. Okay, and then let's look here at the ecosystem benefits. So these are four pictures that I've taken throughout my farming, uh, farming experiences. But to kind of tie these into my bullet points here, the resilient ecosystem is, in my opinion, the number one reason why you would approach an organic system or, you know, just getting away from that conventional production. Um, this is a way to basically decrease your ecological risk and really open yourself up to more of a buffer between, you know, um, more harsh climates that you may, may not be experiencing today, but you might be experiencing a few years from now, or you may have experienced it a few years ago. Um, we talk a lot about uh, within my consulting clients and, and kind of some of the work I've been working on, we talk a lot about how soil health can be affected by some of the usage of, um, of synthetics within your livestock. So down here, we see our nice dung beetle just going to work. Um, and basically, you start to lose out on some of this microbial pop population when you start to use things like dewormers. Um, and, and you know, don't rely on diverse pastures to be your dewormer. This can be an issue that you might not actually even see because it's beneath the soil. But that, that soil health aspect of organic management and beyond is really where we start to see that, that ecological risk going down. And that's something that we really want to de-risk our farming operations. That this is a, a huge way to do that. Uh, I talked about soil microbial health. And then the other thing I like to talk about is the uh, cycles of nature. But it's also just more than carbon. A big 
buzzword now is carbon. Um, and, and really people just wor worrying about carbon credits and the carbon market, but we kind of forget about the rest of the ecosystem that um, really needs to also come along with that, those carbon sequestration activities. Um, that's the water cycle, the mineral cycle, and the microbial cycle amongst many others that you can talk about. But we look at those four cycles of nature to really make sure that our management is boosting all four or five or six or however many cycles you can come up with to really have a more well-rounded operation. So when I was talking about carbon here, a big piece I like to always point to, I worked at White Oak Pastures and I was up there in their internship program. So I always love to show this graphic because it's something that gets talked in a negative tone about in our meat production world, about that cows are the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. And there's, there's a lot of, you know, argument that you can have here, um, and I'm not going to get into that too much, but this is a really good study, a life cycle analysis that they had uh, completed on their farm to really show how much carbon emission they are getting per pound of beef produced on their operation. So to really simplify it, it's this number over here where we're, they're re um, minimizing three and a half uh, pounds of CO2 for every pound of beef that's produced on their operation. So every time you're eating a, well, I don't know who's eating a pound burger, but every time you're eating a quarter pounder from White Oak Pastures, you're reducing your carbon footprint. Now, this is not because White Oak Pastures is some, you know, special uh, tropical place, right? It's, it's, it's because of their management. The way that they manage their cattle and the rest of their enterprises is in a way where they're meeting those cycles of nature to benefit everybody at play. So they're on a rotational grazing cycle. They're really looking at what's happening within their biodiversity, within the bird population, um, within the insect population. They're reducing or not using any um, you know, synthetic fertilizers or uh, antibiotics or any types of health treatments that might you know, put their microbial population down a little bit. So it's it's the management where you can make a difference within your ecosystem. And that really relates back to the certified, to certified organic and to regenerative production models. So now we'll go a little bit into the new, we talked about the ecosystem differences and comparisons and what that looks like in a certified organic model. Um, and now we'll look a little bit about at nutritional differences. Now I do want to preface some of the stats that I'm using here are not specifically pertain to certified organic production, but they fall in that they fall in that area of being above the bar and really doing everything in your power that you can to really show and produce a quality product um, that's keeping every everything else in mind. So with the nutritional differences, I love to look at this one because it really relates back to us as human beings and what we're eating three, four times a day. So the first thing I look at here is the livestock nutrition. So I said a little bit earlier is you are what you eat, right? So if we have um, our livestock, right? And they're on, they're, they're on our farm and we're moving them on a, on a regular basis. Actually, let's start with the conventional side. We're not moving, they're, they're in a sacrificial paddock or they're on a continuous grazing model where they're just turned out to the field See you later. We'll bring you back when it's you know time to uh, harvest our beef, and then maybe they're sending to them to a feedlot or something of that nature. This is where the first bullet point comes into play: rumen health. So rumen health's been studied over the years. Uh, you can see some if you ever YouTube like rumen health um, port analysis. They have this thing on the side of the cow where they can kind of access the rumen and really show you what's actually happening. Um, in the four stomachs. So when you're in a feedlot situation, the cows are usually being fed a grain ration, corn, soy, wheat, whatever that is that really optimizes the grow out and fattening of the finishing uh, phase for cattle. So when they're fed a high, high dose of these grain products, they start to have issues like acidosis, um, different types of fatty liver show up that really become an issue with the cow. The cow is staying alive based on antibiotics and a low, you know, a few months in a finishing uh, situation before they're going to be harvested. If that cow was to have to stay alive without antibiotics or without any type of rumen health um, synthetics that are added into that situation, 
the cow probably wouldn't be able to live a, a few years after that, right? Now, when you start to look at organic or a fully grass-fed pasture-based operation, you're less reliant on um, in, imported grain products. Um, you're not in a feedlot situation. And then the beauty of that is that the rumen health is in a very productive stage where it's fully functioning. It's digesting you know, a variety of forages that they're getting from the pasture and honestly just chain, uh, transferring the, those forages and those fibers into really nutritious proteins. It's an incredible thing to see, but it's really awesome when you realize that they, they fully thrive off grass. So when they are a, truly 100% grass fed and not being fed any type of synthetic um, hay or any, any sprayed um, hay, it really allows the livestock health to be as optimized as it possibly can be. Um, and then when you're looking at that, you're really looking at an overall herd health that would be a lot higher than if you were even on a, on a low diversity pasture or in the case of conventional feedlot systems, um, just a, a much less healthier um, herd. So how this relates to human health, right? So when we're talking about eating you know, different types of beef or pork or chicken or, or whatever, you know, whatever your flavor of the day might be. When you're eating a cow that is being managed to not die and to be in a sick situation, aka the grain feeding feedlot, now you're taking on those proteins. And, and those proteins, there's this cool study here, and I guess I don't actually have it linked, but I'll, another thing I'll throw, oh, no, no, I have it linked on the next slide. Um, a cool study here, again, not specifically pertain to certified organic, but it is pertained to 100% pasture-based systems for cattle. Um, and this was a, a cool, I'll actually pull this up first. So this was a pretty cool study by um, Dr. Stefan Van Vliet. And it's a, it's a really cool study on how um, the phytochemical profile of meat and milk products are a lot higher in a pasture-raised, uh, pasture 100% grass-fed system versus a feedlot um, finished grain-fed system. So you hear a lot about how um, the omega-3 content is a lot higher in this system than it is in this system. And that's absolutely correct. There's, there's, that's been analyzed and it's been shown. It's also in this, um, in this study as well. But where the real difference comes into play is within these phytochemicals. And what are phyto, uh, phytochemicals or phytonutrients? They're secondary compounds. So when you think of primary compounds, you're looking at proteins and fibers and carbohydrates and fats, you know, the macros that we all look at um, from a nutritional standpoint. But what, what are typically not looked at are the secondary compounds. And these are phenols, terpenoids, antioxidants, and a, a lot of some words that you, you might not even be able to pronounce, but a lot of other uh, health benefits that we can optimize here with 100% pasture raised meats and milks. Um, these secondary compounds, their main function is really to prevent um, inflammation and also prevent cellular damage. So uh, although we are getting that higher omega-3 ratio within the fats, those increased phytonutrients are really well rounding the diet when you start to look at what types of meats you're eating. Um, think of it as instead of just hitting your macro pie chart that says you have to have X percent of protein and fat, it's really like you're getting your maybe your daily vitamin within the uh, beef or milk that you're you know consuming on a daily basis. Now, I really like to show this graphic and I really like to talk about this study because when you start to look at it from a consumption point of view, then you really start to pay attention to, okay, I can see this picture and I can see this is a feedlot. And in this feedlot, we're having issues with our phytochemical richness. Now, when you start to get over here, you're looking at the monoculture pasture raised um, model. And we're still like middle of the way here. And if you really dig into the study, you can see some, some really uh, um, detailed stats and, and data. But in, that, in, that, in this monoculture situation, you're really, what that means is basically you're looking at a field of all clover or all, um, you know, ryegrass. And it's just a full ryegrass stand. It's planted with ryegrass and that's it. 
it's better than the feedlot version, but you're still, your, your pasture is not diverse. It's like if you go to the salad bar and just get arugula. It, it does it does okay, but you need some tomatoes and some carrots and some other you know things to jazz up the salad a little bit, right? So when we look at that on a pasture situation, you start to see different forbs coming up from the seed bank or different you know legumes coming up, or or if you're planting cover crops, really just looking to diverse your cover crop mix as much as you can. There's some people out there that are doing 70 way mixes, and maybe that's a little unnecessary, but doing something where you're having you know maybe six or eight different cover crops in your mix to allow for different root depths and different nutritions, they provide the animals a, a, a much wider array of a nutritional profile. And that'll really translate into your meat and milk products. So if you're trying to, you know, let's say you're in a direct marketing situation. And again, we'll touch on markets and economics a little bit um, in, in a few minutes here. But w- when you're looking at a marketing situation, and you're, let's say you're selling grass-fed beef. Well, how do you differentiate your grass-fed beef from your neighbor or from what's in the grocery store? Well, what's in the grocery store might not really pay attention or might not really advertise what types of forages um, and how that impacts their meat. As a smaller producer or a, you know, a mid-sized farm, you can really say, okay, hey, I pay attention to my cover crops. And what I, what I manage for is so that they're getting a variety of different forages to allow for a healthier standpoint for my cattle. 100% grass-fed is not created equal, and this picture really sums that up. And I love to show it because of, because of that reason of the different types of forage and nutrition that your animals are getting from a grass-fed um, based operation, basically. Uh, the link is here, and I believe we will have this out um, uh, maybe in a week or so, this recording. So if you want that link prior, uh, my email will be at the end of this presentation. I'll happily email any links or, um, you know, I can also email the presentation to anybody if they would like. Okay, so now we'll switch over to economics. And this is probably, I would venture to say this is probably why you're here today um, listening to me. So (laughs) thanks for listening to the environmental and nutritional aspects, because when I think of is organic certification worth it? I think those play a huge part in your marketing or in the way you're raising your animals and seeing what your herd health looks like. It's not, it is, it is about the money at the end of the day, but you also have to realize the different types of uh, costs that might show up that are not necessarily showing up on your balance sheet, but they might show up in your management and how you can manage for those things. So, um, but yes, we'll absolutely get into the economics here and really kind of go through what the cost is for certification and what it might make sense for and what it might not make sense for. At the start of the hour, I did say that, you know, it's, it's not really one cut and dry answer. It really does depend on what your operation is, you know, how many animals you're producing and what your market looks like. So we'll totally take a look at that now. Let's start with the cost. So Certification cost. I talk to farmers every day. Uh, some certified or organic, some 100% conventional. So, and everything in between. The number one thing that comes up is it costs too much money. The number two thing that comes up is it's too much work. So, I'm going to kind of debunk those two things right now. But it, it again, it really does depend on your context and where you're coming from as a farm. Somebody that has five cows out in their, you know, couple acre land, it might not make sense at all, but, and it might be very expensive, but for somebody that is running a 300 head cow herd or a lot, even a lot less, and they get the certification, it it might actually not really be that expensive at all. So uh, a big number that I like to look at down here is the 2021 average for the organic livestock scope was a little bit under $1,500. And that's for the certification. So going through the full audit, and getting the certification and going through the OSP and everything of that nature. So I break it down a little bit here. And if you wanna take a screenshot of this, feel free um, to really just kind of get a look at what what all the costs are involved. So we look at the application fee, the basic certification fee, um, inspection fees. So that's coming on the farm to do, you know, any travel for the inspector to come out and then the type of operation. So 
This is depending on what you're doing. For the sake of the conversation today, it's mostly going to be the beef or the dairy. So that's like a, a tacked on expense in those cases versus the crop. And then the number one thing I like to talk about is the uh, cost share program. So the cost share program allow, and this fluctuates year over year, but it, it, right now it's 75% of each scope that you're trying to get certified up to $750. This is a really good program to take advantage of to really kind of cut the cost of organic uh, certification down on your operation. And it's definitely helpful for producers that might fall into a smaller production um, bucket versus the larger scale uh, producer. All of this and more I can totally talk about on one-on-one -on -one or in the Q&A as well. So the next thing I like to look at here with, so we're, we're talking about certification costs. The next thing I would ask any client that would come to me and say, hey, Ryan, I want to go to certified organic production. What, like, what do I do? Does it make sense? What do you think? The number one thing I ask is, do you have a market for it? Are people currently buying your products? Do you have a um, wholesale agreement with somebody with milk? You always hear about the milk contracts with a variety of different milk aggregations. And it's real, for milk, it's really, do you have a organic market that's going to be available and have a contract for you? With meat, it does get a little bit different. So there's less of a regional um, aggregation model in place for organic meat producers. They're starting to pop up and I've seen a few that are starting to take place more on the East Coast um, rather than the West Coast. But those are different types of agreements that can be in place to buy live weight animals. And if you meet that certification or if that's a requirement of these aggregators, then it might make total sense for you. Now, everything in between that, we, we look at these four different buckets. So the self-sufficient homestead, which is cool as all hell, but might not make sense for this, the direct consumer brand, the wholesale partnerships, and then the grower partner, which is basically what I touched on um, with aggregation. So for the self-sufficient homestead, this might be more of, uh, if you're going to go with certified organic, um, that whole certification process, this might be more of an internal thing. You're, you're not necessarily looking to make a return on the cost that goes into your certification, um, a financial return rather. Maybe it's something that you really want to get your land certified organic and have your animals grazing on certified organic land. That's great. I, I always say more power to you with that, but in terms of a cost benefit analysis, might not necessarily make sense. The direct to consumer brand is where things start to percolate in the conversation. So with this, I've worked for two farms that were direct to consumer brands and it from a, from a uh, 30,000 foot view, it profit wise, it makes so much sense. You're dependent on your own production. You're, you know, maybe vertically integrating as much as you possibly can. And you're building your own brand up. And I love this model, but it definitely comes with added responsibilities. So that is first and foremost. Secondly, is what are your customers asking for? So can you tell your story on social media that, you know, you're the family farm and you're doing this kind of grazing and that this, uh, this type of uh, management. Um, maybe you have a good question and answer about what you do on your farm. We see a lot of um, organic, pro organic production, but, or beyond organic production, but not certified. See that all the time. Um, and, you know, no harm, no foul there, but it is something that your customers are going to pay for or pay a higher premium for if you have that certification on the seal, ask your customers. Maybe that is, maybe, maybe it does make sense. And if it's only going to cost you a little bit under $2,000, maybe that will open up your customer base um, on, your, on your direct consumer brand a little bit more. Um, this is definitely something where it's more of a feedback loop with your customers or with whatever situation you're in um, from a direct marketing standpoint. Wholesale partnerships is where it's pretty much an, a, a no-brainer um, to either yes, go certified organic or no. What is that wholesale partner looking for? Is the grocery store uh, you know, one of these smaller natural retailers and all they take is certified organic? Then boom, your question's answered if that market is available for you. If not, and if you can tell your story, then maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't make sense for you. But in that wholesale partnership, 
you're able to really analyze and say, okay, I can go certified organic because I'm getting X amount of dollars per pound of beef and I have this contract set up in place. Um, that's a pretty big cornerstone client of mine and I'll be able to may maybe do that production model. Um, these, these are the areas, these three bullet points are the areas that I really say, okay, this is where you're gonna kn know or not know whether you need to go certified or organic. And if you don't, maybe it's just a couple questions away to some customers maybe some team members or just your community. All right, so piggybacking off of that, we really look at, is it worth it? And here I, I first had certified organic and conventional, but then I changed it to not certified because there are producers out there that are not certified organic that are above and beyond when it comes to production models. One thing that is missing in that situation is that there's no national standard to go by. So, you know, do you know your farmer? Are you asking them questions? That's great. And I'm sure that there is as much integrity as you can possibly get. But a big thing to really make sure of is, you know, if they're not certified, they actually can use different types of input that are not certified organic. Um, are they doing that? I'm not saying that by any means. I'm sure, you know, if you have a relationship with your farmer, I think that is first and foremost over going to the grocery store and buying, you know, whatever's on the shelf. But understanding that that national standards auditable and in place really kind of allows you to kind of take a deep breath and say, okay, they don't use antibiotics because they literally, they literally can't use them. If they do, it'll come up in the audit and then that will, you know, provide an issue for that farm. Um, if you are asking your farmer that question, great, more power to you because there is definitely a list of questions that you should be asking your farmer if you're buying locally. Um, so we'll stay on the certified organic side. The, like I said on the last slide, is there an available market? Um, if you get certified production or certified organic, will that affect your market? Will that diversify your market and add new um, you know, new marketing opportunities in there. You know, you, you see a lot of this direct to consumer starting to pop up, but being able to sell 40% of your production off to, you know, maybe three or four different wholesale contracts really might open you up and kind of have that cash flow in place to support your business and support your farm um, to have, uh, to allow you to kind of lower the overall risk of your production model. This last or this bullet point right here in infrastructure changes is one that I love to talk about because it can be a big it can be a big thing to change you know if you have some illustrious uh, feedlot system or you know some crazy barn and, and not that much pasture and you need to buy a lot buy a lot of land that can be extremely costly if you do have land and you need to put up some permanent fencing that can also be pretty costly um, within my consulting clients I try and minimize cost as much as I possibly can when it comes to infrastructure, because there is so many resources out there that you can use to really, you, you'll still, you know, you'll still be paying money for whatever type of grazing model you might be going after, but there's ways to kind of minimize that and not have to take a loan out to be able to support those different types of infrastructure changes. Really totally depends on your operation and what you have um, within your existing farm. And that's something we can always take a look at to say, yeah, it's going to cost a lot of money or, you know, you can get it done with poly wire and step in posts and yada, yada. Uh, the next bullet point being record keeping. I love talking about record keeping because most of these records that are being asked in, in the organic certification process, you probably already have records of them. It's not the, the record keeping does not become as monotonous as it may um, seem or may be explained from farm to farm. Uh, at Rodale, it's something that we help out with, and I'll kind of go into that after the presentation. But it's definitely something where you, if you're running your business or your farm as a business, you will have these records, and this side of things is not as difficult as people might make it out to be. Uh, size of the operation of value add. I love to talk about this. I kind of already did talk about this, but if you're, you know, a really small operation and you're selling hams and holes of beef, it might not make sense. Um, it might make sense, but it, it might not be. Um, if you're running a hundred head and, you know, have a bunch of slaughter spots, this is where things start to become more apparent um, in terms of certification. 
And then on the not certified side of things, when I was talking about the direct consumer brand, if you have a flourishing market and it's there and you don't need it, maybe it's not worth it to you. Maybe it's something that you want to say, hey, I'm going to do this anyway, just to give that uh, reliability to my customers. Maybe that's something that you've already established with your customers. Maybe you're transparent with every last one of them and you might not need the certification. Uh, to show that, you know, having having conversations with your customers as my, as a you know past farmer it was one of my favorite things because, you know, they might just be asking, oh, like, do the cows eat grass? And then you can really go in and say, hey, you know, they also do this, this, and this um, within our rotational grazing model. Uh, but a nice way to kind of have that benchmark is that certification seal um, on the label. Uh, another big piece here is organic processing. And this is something that I would say is probably the biggest thing to really look at. Pennsylvania is one of, in terms of meat processing capabilities, has some of the highest amount of meat processing um, in the state uh, across the 50 states, which is pretty crazy because you always hear about there's no processing, there's no processing. But there is a lot of processing. The one thing about this is that there's very low organic processing capabilities in Pennsylvania. I believe we're at one processor left in the state that can actually take on um, farm or, or has processing slots for farmers that actually is certified. I, I know of one other that will be certified um, in Southwest PA in, I guess, like at the end of the year this year. So that definitely helps things out. But this is something that is really key. If you want to sell certified organic process, uh, products, having an organic processor is, you know, is an imminent thing. You need that or else you can't um, sell certified organic meat. Uh, I, another piece I like to say there is if you're really trying to get the certification, talk with your processor. It's not that much of a, it's not that big of a deal for the processor to go certified organic. It's a lot more of a process for the farm. Um, but when it comes to the processor, again, something that Rodale can help the processor out with along that process, uh, but it's, it's not as big of a um, task, I would say, for the processor to do it versus the farm. Okay, so now we'll just go to benefits and challenges here, and then hopefully I'll have some time to answer any questions. But benefits, I already touched on a lot of these, but national standards, um, organic matter boosts the soil. And we did talk about the resiliency within your ecosystem and how that can help de-risk your operation. Uh, Long-term pasture health increase. This is when I was talking about, you know, getting more forage utilization out of your pastures and on your farm uh, year over year. It's not, it's never, uh, it's going to happen next year uh, or, you know, tomorrow, but over year over year, you'll see more forage starting to grow if you're managing it correctly in a grazing standpoint. Then we see some input savings. Now, this is something that I like to talk to people, input savings here on hay, tractors, and fertilizers. Um, I guess, increased budget for labor. Usually organic and regenerative production, that requires more labor-intensive models. Um, so that's definitely something to not, you know, fantasize about, okay, there's all these savings. Well, there is additional labor that usually is needed. Um, there's definitely some savings and less reliance on off-farm inputs, which is a, a huge thing in the uh, world of, you know, inflation when it comes to off-farm inputs. Uh, we talked about herd health uh, challenges, no transition market. So if you are transitioning your land, that's a three-year process. In those three years, you don't have organic products. So you still have to sell into a conventional market um, or whatever, you know, whatever market situation you might be in. And then the certification cost that we discussed, uh, whether that's a lot or a little really depends on your farm. Um, so I kind of touched on all of these. This is kind of just my sum up page of we talked about this, the nutritional differences, differences with higher nutrition um, and then the increasing importance of food transparency for families and communities. Um, this is something that I only see, you know, as the internet and as things continue to just grow like crazy, people are paying so much attention to food transparency. I have family members that have probably never read a nutritional label in their life starting to ask me about some of the most complicated questions in nutrition um, when, it, when it comes to um, organically produced meat. And, and it's really cool to see that because it's, 
you know, there's, there's marketing out there or there's more of a, a magnifying glass on this side of food transparency. And I think, unfortunately, COVID really did boost that up when we started to see no meat on the shelf. Um, so, you know, along with nutritional benefits, you also have maybe more of a stable supply uh, with a regional producer or with your local farm. Um, and then economics was just the additional markets and the national standard benchmark that we can rely on. So all of that being said, um, I'm absolutely open to talking more about anything um, relating this presentation or anything relating livestock production, um, both certified organic and not. Uh, my contact information is here. Feel free to call me, text me, email me, whatever floats your boat, anytime. I'm always available and around to talk farming um, and anything food related. I'm a huge foodie. That's why I'm in this game now. So I, uh, I love to talk about all things nutrition and um, farming related. So feel free, seriously, feel free to use um, those contacts, that contact information, um, like I'm your best friend. So feel, feel free to do that. And then as an aside, just to kind of go into our organic consulting services that I mentioned a few times, um, we started in 2019 as a consulting team. Um, I came on board in August as a livestock consultant, and we really offer up one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship and collaboration with farmers um, pretty much anywhere in the world. And we kind of talk about different types of you know, questions that might come up along the transition, um, on-farm consultations. So like a site visit, come out, look at the pastures, look at your fencing or from a livestock standpoint and really just see like what different types of improvements we can do. Um, my role specifically, I work a lot with different types of grazing plans and grazing strategies. Um, I don't push any, you know, product brands, but I do work a lot with you or with a farm about like what types of products I, I've liked in the past um, when it comes to a rotational grazing standpoint, um, soil health and, and soil testing crop rotation planning, you name it, all, all of these services are kind of included in our consulting. Um, and then, like I mentioned at the start of the hour, I have a pretty diverse team of experience. So when it, when it, whether it comes to permaculture or uh, small diversified farms um, that are producing all kinds of diversified vegetable farms, um, row crops, um, I'm trying to think of what else, fruit, nut orchards, dairy, meat, you name it. Uh, we have some experience with it. So feel free to also contact me or visit that link there to um, get engaged with our consulting service. And another little plug here, but for Pennsylvania, it is a free service um, for farmers that are looking to transition to certified organic. So definitely a very nice resource. Um, you know, being in the, in the farming production side of things would love to have used this as a, uh, as a farmer. So that is my spiel. There's my contact information again, and would be totally fine opening up to questions for these last five minutes or, you know, calling a quit there, whatever works for everybody on the call. But I just really want to thank you guys um, for joining me today for, for this hour long webinar and really look forward to meeting up with you um, in the future or uh, through these different contact information um, route that you can go. So thanks again. And yeah, seriously, any questions, riddle them off in the chat can be as uh, big or small questions as you want. Thank you. All right. So I have the link that I was referencing earlier. Let me just throw that here. Anybody wants to read that? That's the uh, grass-fed um, meat and milk study from Stefan Van Bleet. I believe Fred Pervenz is also on that too. Great book. I have it here somewhere. If anybody wants to read it, I'm kind of just going off cue here, but uh, Nourishment, great book. He kind of worked on this study as well. So super cool stuff there. Just wanted to follow up and make sure that everybody had that link just in case. Yep, sorry, Chris. And I realized I just put that only to Justin. So there we go. Cool. Yeah, he does a, I'm just kind of rambling at this point. So if you want to, if you want to pop off or ask a question, feel free. Um, but Stefan Van Vliet's a really cool um, guy to follow. He was at Duke um, doing a lot of uh, regenerative agriculture studies. And then I think he's at Utah State now. 
Um, he has some really cool work around the phytonutrient analysis that I just sent here. And then he also has a study in here somewhere. It's a meta, uh, metabolomics, I think is how you say it, study. And basically this study compares uh, plant-based meat and grass-fed uh, meat and looks at the nutritional makeup of each and kind of compares and contrasts them. Both of these are kind of studies that are obviously leading into another ventricle of studies to really further um, this type of work to really get a better understanding of what that looks like. Uh, for grass-fed producers, um, that's something that is, in my opinion, something that you can really dive into to say, okay, let's, um, let's start to kind of Un unravel that and see what that looks like from a forage perspective and a, um, and a production perspective. Cool. One question in the chat here. Joel, USDA processor in Southwest PA, do you know if they would be approved for poultry processing? Unfortunately not. He produces or processes pigs, cow, cattle, and I want to say he also does lamb, but I know that's something a little bit lower on his totem pole, so I'm not sure if that's staying or going. Um, from his processing business. Poultry processing has been a big topic of discussion um, recently with a lot of producers that I've worked with, strictly because of just how it's, um, I guess, like how unavailable it is right now. There is that nice Pennsylvania exemption um, that you can do on farm processing. Obviously that, you know, includes you having to do that. But uh, I know, I believe, Caleb Stoltzfus, I'm sure if you're looking for poultry processing, you've heard his name come up before. He had a mobile processing unit that he would bring to farms and do the processing for X amount of dollars per pound. He is no longer doing on-farm processing, but I believe you can rent his trailer um, to the farm for, I forget, off, I don't want to say a fee off the top of my head because I don't know it, but I know it, it's a pretty reasonable one. And I'm actually going out this weekend to, uh, I believe we're using his, but I'm actually going out there this weekend um, to a farm to do some poultry processing myself. So if you want to follow up with me, I'll let you know how, uh, how much it costs and um, <laughs> whether or not it's a, uh, some good infrastructure. I'm sure it is. Um, I know he was doing really good work um, around the state when it comes to poultry. I also have some resources too, if you wanna purchase some types of infrastructure for that, um, what you really need for that uh, just type of like blueprint um, for having an efficient process. It does require people, but um, you know, it's, it's a cool, from a poultry processing standpoint, it's a cool thing to kind of offer up. You, you might not think of this, but it's a cool thing to offer up as a on-farm activity for people to come learn. Obviously it's not just like free labor. You have to teach people how to do it um, and really kind of like communicate that. And it's not something you can depend on week after week, but uh, it might open up some eyes to, you know, people that are interested in getting more engaged with their food. I've seen a lot of people starting to do on-farm harvests of cattle, pigs, chickens, you name it. And it's really been, um, a pretty cool experience. I don't know if it's really helped like th throughput metrics, but it's been a cool experience to get, um, you know, some of your customers engaged with your on-farm um, activities. Again, I'm rambling. So feel free to throw anything in the chat, um, throw anything in the Q&A. If you just want to get off, no worries. I'll also throw my email in here if anybody wants to. There we go. Boom. Cool. Text me, call me, email me at any of those um, anytime. Always down to cut it up about anything farming. So 